Good morning, everyone, once again. I'm encouraged by your presence here and your willingness to study from God's Word. I encourage you to follow along as we go through the lesson this morning. As Mickey said, we're, we're doing a series of lesson, uh, lessons exploring the character of several figures from Old Testament <laughs> Scripture. Uh, again, examining some you're probably familiar with, like Joshua, uh, Jonathan, Daniel, and some you may not be as well acquainted with, and maybe even have, pronouncing, have trouble pronouncing their names as I do. Uh, Jehonadab and, and Shechaniah have particular trouble with. For this particular lesson, uh, we're going to be looking at the character of Noah, uh, kind of appropriate this morning, I guess, with our, our rain we got coming in here, coming in kind of soggy, uh, but we'll go ahead and, and begin this lesson. We're going to talk first about the, the world and the days of Noah, because it, it, we can't really speak about Noah without noting the context, the state of the world when she lived, the, the nature of God who, whom he served, um, and of course that great flood that, that would be uh, the major point in his life and what we usually associate with him. We think of ourselves as living in a godless era, and certainly it does seem like mankind is, is turning away from God just more and more each day, but surely the time in which Noah represents the absolute worst case scenario. Uh, turning back to Genesis chapter 6, so verse, looking at verses 11 through 12, we read that now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Genesis 6 and verse 5, uh, going back a few verses, says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So during the days of Noah, we see that all of creation is entirely stained by the blight of sin. And I doubt what we can fathom. I mean, we we kind of think we can get there, but I doubt we can fathom the perpetual misery that must have been, the terror of living in a world completely consumed by sin. Uh, surely this would have been an extremely violent and ridiculously treacherous world. Uh, consider that even in the rebellious times in which we live, we can find some relief in knowing that we have the love of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, even though we find ourselves in a crowd of unbelievers, it's not difficult to find some with redeeming qualities, uh, some good in their heart despite their lack of faith, some, some good, good people, as, uh, so to call it there. However, we read that in the times uh, this time there was not even an inkling of goodwill, charity, or love to be found in the heart of mankind. No, all of man humanity's desires were fixated only on self-gratification to whatever loathsome, atrocious methods they could conceive. Uh, so whatever it takes to get there, they were willing to do it. Uh, mankind, uh, God's beloved, most beloved creation, made in his holy likeness, rejected their creator with every fiber of their being. So again, just continuous evil we see described here in Genesis 6. Genesis 6, 6 tells us, again, just again, how bad the situation was. The Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So we see not only is he regretting creating mankind, but it's grieved him here. And it's, again, it's kind of punctuates the, again, the, the tragedy here that's taken place. The state of the world gotten so wicked that God, a righteous judge, looked upon it and became distraught to the point of grief. When we think of a place overflowing with wickedness, we probably think of Sodom and Gomorrah as you know, students of the Scripture. Recall in Genesis 18, you know, Abraham attempting to intercede on behalf of Sodom. And the Lord agreed that he would spare the city from destruction if only 50 righteous people could be found there. And we know that, that as that story continues, the number just kind of dwindles. So we get to 10, and by the end of the conversation, we can't even find that. Not even 10 righteous people could be found in Sodom. And that's pretty bleak to, to imagine. But imagine an entire world full of Sodoms, and there's hardly anybody righteous to be found. But it was in these dark times that Noah would live. And thankfully, Noah was counted righteous and served as a beacon of hope in this dark world. Uh, Genesis 6, 8 tells us, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord, a verse we're going to return to a little bit later on. Uh, so for this lesson, let's consider, you know, what was it that made Noah different? What aspects of his character are worthy of our emulation uh, today as we seek to serve God as well? First point we want to address and look at is the fact that Noah was reverent. <clears throat> and so this caused him to stand out in this, in this sinful world uh, because of his reverence. Consider that the age of Noah was within this time of the patriarchs, an era in which God had direct contact with mankind through the head of the family, uh, Adam and Abraham and others there along the way. When literally all the other people of the world ignored God, we see that Noah acknowledged him. And not only that, but Noah remained faithful at a time when the entirety of the rest of the world rejected God and his precepts. Genesis 6 and 9 says, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And that last phrase, Noah walked with God, indicates that Noah had a close relationship with God. And as a result, he developed a godly character. Noah was called righteous. He was called blameless in his generation. In a world in which the rest of mankind's every waking thought was fixated on wickedness, the bar has to be set pretty low if you think about it. And yet Noah's conduct we see is beyond reproach. Despite the sinful society in which he lived, Noah overcame what must have been overwhelming temptation to conform to the sinful nature of those around him. Instead, he maintained a pure heart that yearned to serve God. Thus, the holy God deemed him worthy. 
No, we see, has an abiding fear, a humble respect, and a deep love for God. Therefore, he took God's warnings of this coming flood very seriously. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7 says, By faith, uh, Noah, being warned by God concerning the events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. The Hebrew writer brings forth a powerful point concerning Noah's faith. He was warned by God concerning as, uh, events as yet unseen. And so we see here that you know, some, this faith is something that's beyond what we are able to tangibly uh, you know, perceive. Uh, some of us speculated that it's not rained at all on the planet Earth at this point in history. And there certainly hadn't been a global flood uh, or a flood of this magnitude at all before. And yet despite witnessing or never experiencing or witnessing anything like this before, Noah trusted the word of God. Hebrews 11 and 1 reminds us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And continuing to our own time, and skipping ahead a little bit here, I think we find that God desires the same kind of faith and, and conduct in us today. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7 uh, tells us, or taking this, taking this uh, verse here, For we walk by faith and not by sight. John 20 and verse 29, Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Uh, and again, that, that story of, of we often call Doubting Thomas there. We have a faith that Christ would uh, commend here. In keeping the kind of faith that Noah had, we would likewise do well to imitate Noah's dedication to seeking to be righteous and blameless in our own generation. And this verse has been brought into our house so fairly recently. Uh, I think it was a memory verse in Brandy's class that she's teaching. Uh, Le- Leviticus 11.44, Consecrate yourselves, therefore, be holy, for I am holy. So seeing that we seek to serve a holy God, uh, if we seek to properly please Him, we're going to try to emulate Him and, and become holy as He is. Another point I want to bring forth about Noah was the fact that he was uh, obedient. I got my notes out of, out of sync here, so let me get these back on track. And Noah exhibited obedience by taking the task that God set before him seriously. In building the ark, Noah did work according to God's specifications. We see that God gave Noah the exact pattern for the building of the ark in Genesis 6, 14 through 16. And just kind of uh, glancing over these, we see the materials of the ark would be gopher wood, uh, covered inside and out with pitch. We see that we has exact dimensions to follow, being 300 cubits long, 50, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high, the equivalent today of 450 seven by 75 by 45 feet. Features would have uh, one window and one door with three decks filled with rooms. And we notice that God, or Noah did not add to God's commands in any way, nor did he take away from God's commands. Noah did not deviate from the specifications one way or the other, nor do we read of him questioning even God's directions. Uh, I've heard preachers you know, make the point, you know, he could have argued, you know, go for wood, you know, what is it, cypress, I think is what I found in my studies. Why not cedar? Would cedar work better? I, I don't know, to be honest, I don't know. But maybe Noah could have made that argument. Just one window, God? What if we added a sunroof to this thing? When it came to collecting the various species of animals, Noah likewise took careful note of God's instructions in Genesis 6 and 7. We don't read of him looking for loopholes nor seeking to supplant God's will in, in any kind of way with his own. You want me to collect all kinds of animals? I don't, even snakes? I don't much care for snakes. Genesis 6, 22 tells us that this was not the case, that whenever he was commanded, Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. And it might sound like a silly thought experiment, but consider what would have happened if Noah had not built the ark. What would happen to him and his family? Surely they would have perished in the flood, obviously. Uh, no doubt God could have saved them by some miraculous kind of method, but you know, this is the method that God chose. It would have done Noah no good to merely believe God's warning. Noah's belief was manifested in action. He had a working faith, as we call it today. Likewise, today our belief should cause us to act. Our faith should be evident in our words and our deeds. James wrote the following considering the relationship between faith and works in James chapter 2, 14 through 25. We'll just go ahead and read that whole section there. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also by faith, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have my faith, or you have faith and I have my works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that apart from faith, or that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. 
And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him, uh, counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And so we see, again with the example of Noah and also throwing in Abraham there, our faith would be useless without faithful, obedient actions. God desires in us a working faith today, just as he always has for those who would follow him. Now, hoping my notes are aligned with the, uh, the presentation once again here. I had to switch around a page there, so hopefully we're back on track. Noah was also diligent. Is another point we want to consider as we look at the life of Noah and the kind of character that he had. Through all the hardships that he faced, and surely there were many, as we'll see, Noah endured. As previously discussed, Noah stood firm in the face of temptation. He strived to serve God despite being surrounded by rampant ungodliness. Throughout his life, he worked diligently to serve God. For reference in Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, we read that Noah was a herald of righteousness. And the word herald, meaning, of course, messenger, indicates that Noah apparently served as a preacher. And though this would probably be a fruitless endeavor, no doubt be a fruitless endeavor in this wicked generation that he would be a part of, Noah nevertheless warned his peers of the forthcoming judgment of God, <clears throat> lest they repent of their wickedness. No doubt, Noah endured mockery and likely even persecution of those that he sought to teach. Yet through it all, Noah set his mind to the work that God had set before him. He did not allow any kind of discouragement to get to him as he, and he pressed on. God also expects us, us to preach the gospel, even if our efforts are ultimately yield little to no results. Looking over at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 5, it says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the, of the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Likewise, we look in 1 Peter chapter 2, in verses 19 through 21, which says, For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you, uh, when you sin, you are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For this, through this you've been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might also fall in his steps. Turn our attention back to the example of Noah. Consider also just the physical labor, how labor-intensive it must have been to build the ark, to round up the various animals. Uh, but we see that Noah wasn't afraid to, as we call it, get his hands dirty. He would roll up his sleeves and set about doing God's task, working tirelessly for 120 years, uh, maybe possibly preaching and building the ark simultaneously. We would do well to, call, or do well to have what we call the work ethic of Noah uh, when it comes to doing God's work. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9 tells us, Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we reap if we do not give up. And I'm guessing that Noah had no previous experience in the field of nautical engineering or in wrangling wildlife, yet he didn't allow this inexperience to stop him from doing either. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58, of an application for us today, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. We see that God wants us to grow in our faith, and growth often requires going outside of our comfort zone. As we've previously seen, one of our primary works ought to be evangelizing, something we've put uh, a lot of thought into here in recent times uh, in our congregation. In addition to praying for opportunities to share our faith, we ought to dedicate ourselves to studying God's Word so we can share the gospel of Christ with others. We should practice uh, and be developing the skills that will allow us to be more effective teachers. So we could, again, emulate the diligence of Noah. While we focus up to this point on the positive aspects of Noah's character, we have to point out, however, that Noah was a mere mortal like the rest of us, and unfortunately that means that he was not without his shortcomings. And this fact is highlighted in an incident occurring sometime following the flood in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 20, which says, Noah began to be a man of the soil and planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and land covered in his tent. While there is no, more to this story, notably the sin of Noah's youngest son, Ham, we're going to focus our attention on Noah's drunkenness. And the question arises, you know, was Noah's drunkenness something that was intentional? Did he willfully grow his vineyard for the purpose of making the wine by which he had inebriated? Or was Noah some kind of pioneer in the winemaking and, their, uh, winemaking and therefore unaware of the intoxicating effects of drinking a fermented beverage in excess? Going back to the intentional theory, we're going to propose another possibility that was recently suggested in a podcast I got to listen to by, by two mics that you might know. 
um, they suggested that maybe Noah was driven to drink, so to speak, uh, due to a struggle with what we call today and diagnose as post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Consider the horror uh, and how awful it would be uh, surviving a worldwide flood. Noah, no doubt, knew many of the people who would perish in the flood. Some of these were Noah's family, uh, possibly friends, and most definitely acquaintances, people he would have common uh, contact with on a daily basis, who despite their sins were human beings of whom Noah likely cared for. Imagine being on the ark as the floodwaters began to lift the, the boat up. Imagine hearing the banging of hands on the hull of the ship, hearing the pleading cries of those damned outside as they begged to be let in, only for their voices to fall eerily silent as they come to their ultimate demise. Though the post-flood world was certainly spiritually cleansed, what did the physical aftermath look like? We know from watching the news, from floods that occur today, how devastating they can be, uh, but that felt board version, uh, as Michael Ray calls it sometimes in the story, is often presented with cheerful imagery of Noah and his entourage stepping out of the ark into a paradise. In reality, they were quite literally walking out into a post-apocalyptic wasteland of destruction and decay, which would be the ruinous cost of mankind's sin run amok. Uh, Romans 6, 23 reminds us, the wages of sin is death. Yes, this rainbow would appear in the sky to signal God's covenant with Noah, and its beauty would indicate you know, a future of hope. But Noah likely had some difficult things that he had to deal with. Did Noah struggle with feelings of what we would call today, again, survivor's guilt or other forms of trauma? Was it struggles that led him to substance abuse? I do not put forth this idea to excuse Noah's conduct in, the incidents, uh, in this incident, nor to nor the sin of drunkenness. This is most certainly condemned elsewhere in Scripture, but helps, perhaps it does help us to understand and have some empathy for those who struggle with such problems today. Again, besides Christ, no one is perfect. 1 John 1, 8 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. Acknowledging this, we should strive to have empathy for those who struggle with sin in whatever various form it takes on. Colossians chapter 3, 12 through 14 reminds us, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has also forgiven you, you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So we've established that Noah had shortcomings, and like, and like Noah, the rest of us all fall short. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 reminds us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. However, as we move toward the end of the lesson, let's conclude with the message of hope. Despite Noah's sin, we see that is mentioned that is often referred to in the hall, he's referred to in what we call the Hall of Fame of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11. And this, to me at least, seems to indicate that Noah was in the end redeemed, uh, becoming that heir of righteousness that comes by faith as recorded in Hebrews 11, 7. Likewise, we see that there is hope for God's grace and God's grace for the rest of us. Let's rewind back to the beginning of this lesson and take a moment to re-examine that word favor that we read previously in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8, recalling that we read, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. The word favor here is translated from the Hebrew word hen, which can also be translated as grace. And in fact, depending on the translation you're reading from uh, this morning, this verse may even read, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, NKJV, for example, um, in this case, the, old, the one we've quoted from this lesson was to be the ESV uh, translation. Nelson's Bible Dictionary says the following on grace. Kindness shown without regard to the worth or merit of the one who receives it and in spite of the person that deserves. Grace is one of the key attributes of God. Therefore, grace is almost always associated with mercy, love, and compassion, and patience. Returning back to Romans 3, we see that Paul thankfully had a little bit more to say on the matter. So looking at the whole quote from Romans chapter 3, 23-25 tells us here that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift though through, or through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over their former sins. I'm sure through the course of our studies this week on the various Old Testament characters during our gospel meeting that we're going to find like many of the Old Testament figures, Noah's story would ultimately point toward the coming of Christ. After Noah and his family exited the ark, God proclaimed a covenant with Noah beneath that rainbow in the cloud. As a part of this covenant, he made the following precept in Genesis chapter 9, uh, verses 5 through 6. And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from each human being, too. I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall shed, or their blood be shed, for in the image of God has God made mankind." 
While this edict likely refers to the bloodshed uh, through hate, uh, murder, and those kind of situations, it reminds us of this heavy price that sin carries, a price that can only be paid for in blood. The NKJV, once again, uh, looking at the New King James Version, is rather than saying accounting, says reckoning. Uh, I will demand a reckoning for blood that's shed. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, we're not going to read the whole thing, but we're going to kind of sample some things here from Hebrews chapter 10. We find a great discussion on the Old Testament and animal sacrifices, and as it relates to us today. Looking over at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, it says, For since the law has but a shadow of good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it's impossible by the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. We see that the sin was just put off for a time and kind of forgotten for, for, for a, a, like a, what has appeared of a year there, as we see in that context. The writer also points out that through these sacrifices, though they were numerous beyond counting, the blood of the bulls and goats there, were ultimately insufficient to fully cover the stain of sin. Now, again, kind of sampling a, little, a couple of verses to make the point from Hebrews chapter 10, looking at verses uh, 5 first, tells us that consequently Christ came into the wor world. Verses 10 through 12 says, And by that we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And continue on to verse 14, For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Thus we see it was only possible to cleanse the sin, uh, or cleanse any sin, through the shedding of Christ's blood. Returning back to Nelson's Bible Dictionary, uh, explains here, the grace of God was supremely revealed and given in the person and the works of Jesus Christ. Jesus was in the flesh its very embodiment, bringing it into humankind for salvation. By his death and resurrection, Jesus restored the broken fellowship between God and his people. The only way for salvation uh, for any person is through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we see in Acts chapter 15 and verse 11. <laughs> Moving to the conclusion here. I think I started the conclusion a little bit earlier, but we're actually in the conclusion now at this point. Uh, we must realize that God's attitude towards sin has not changed. Uh, mankind will once again be judged, this time once and for all. Jesus said the following concerning the coming judgment day. Looking at Matthew chapter 24, verses 37 to 39, and also verse 44, it says, For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving away and giving away in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. They were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Therefore, you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. So we see that we're going to be judged uh, once again as they were in the day of no days of Noah. Thankfully, however, God's grace has also not changed. Uh, God gave grace to Noah, and He freely gives it today to us through Jesus Christ. Look over at 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 20-22. It says, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and power uh, been subjected to him. Here we find that Peter likens the ark uh, Noah constructed to the vessel of salvation by which, or by the vessel of salvation via waters of the flood to baptism, the symbolic method by which God saves us today. So truly wrapping up the lesson here, so my lessons sometimes have like three conclusions, so apologies for that. <laughs> I'm like, we're going to finish this, and we keep going a little bit, a little bit further. Let us be like Noah. In reverence, let us trust in God and live by his precepts, seeking to be found righteous and blameless in our own generation. Let us be like Noah in obedience. Let us strive to do all command, God commands according to his holy word, not arguing against his word, bucking against it, trying to substitute our own will for his will, any, anything like that. Let us be like Noah in diligence. Let us endure, working always to grow in our faith and sharing the gospel with others. And finally, let us acknowledge our shortcomings, admit that we fall short, and that we confess that we're guilty of sin, appeal to God's amazing grace through uh, Jesus Christ, which allows us to stand before Him redeemed, and like Noah, finally and truly righteous and blameless. And I was afraid this was going to happen. I was going to finish the lesson, I'd get to the end and say, okay, we're all going to stand up and sing, and those things here, but this being the, the morning class, we're, we're not going to do that, I guess. 
Um, but I do want to kind of conclude here. This is the fourth conclusion now. Fourth conclusion here. Offering the invitation. Uh, surely that invitation is open at any time. Uh, if anyone has any, any questions or, or anything they'd like to bring uh, to, the, to the congregation's attention that we can help you with, we'd be glad to do that this time or any time. Uh, but thank you for following along with me as we went through this lesson. It was a good, good study and, again, kind of interesting, again, that these Old Testament characters would point to the coming of Christ and his ultimate sacrifice that he would be willing to take on our behalf. Uh, thank you, everyone.